another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits, there are no boundaries. This is Off Planet Radio. Well, good evening and welcome to Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Hawkins. And you know, just about the time you think you've got things figured out, something screws up in an even better way than before. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're 10 minutes late due to phone connection issues and uh, crashing audio software. And it is the peril fraught, always interesting, never boring, but sometimes... Attention providing Off Planet Radio Live. It's uh, Wednesday night, May 22nd, 2013, and uh, strange days indeed. And uh, we have a good show lined up for tonight. Very interesting subject matter. Uh, we're kind of staying in the groove with the UFO thing right now. We have some other shows coming up in the near future that will diverge from that path, but never too much because everything's connected. And uh, Chris Holly is off tonight. Uh, she will be back again next week because next week our guest is going to be radio talk show host ufologist Kate Valentine will be with us for two hours. And... Uh, it looks a lot sometimes like maybe the world, the mainstream, is catching up with us. Um, I don't know how many people saw this. I posted yesterday to uh, the Off Planet Radio blog, offplanetradio.com, an article from Forbes.com about uh, cold fusion. Uh, Lenner, low energy nuclear reaction, has been independently tested. Um, Dr. Rossi Zcat device has been independently tested by a uh, an outside laboratory and the conclusion was quote a high temperature development of the original apparatus which also has undergone many construction changes in the last two years is the latest product manufactured by Leonardo Corporation it is a device allegedly capable of producing heat from some type of reaction the origin of which is unknown and uh, of course that's the out scientist, outside scientists talking but it is said that the reaction coming from the uh, Rossi low energy nuclear reaction machine is in fact quite profound and so we have for the first time a confirmation of cold fusion zero point energy and um, this is important it's a game changer um, I don't think we're going to see it here in the United States anytime soon but it will begin to move the conversation towards uh, free energy and interestingly enough it's it's connected in many different ways to the UFO alien thing as well I don't think they're driving big blocks diesels out there in the galaxies. The other thing that's interesting to connect is mainstream media is getting the message a uh, May 10th, 2013 article at VanityFair.com Alien Nation of Humans Been Abducted by Extraterrestrials. It's an excellent article on the late Dr. John Mack written by Ralph Blumenthal at VanityFair.com There's hope that the world is catching up with us. Um, these are signs of hope in an otherwise dark world and our thoughts and our prayers with those out there in Oklahoma who were uh, affected by this horrible superstorm that hit the uh, midsection of the country. And um, without a lot of further ado, I want to bring on my guests tonight. Um, they were individually, they would be almost fascinating guests uh, by themselves, but together they provide a very potent team discussing the very things that we've talked about on this show for many years. The book is called The Alien Abduction Files, the most startling cases of human alien contact ever reported. It is on New Page Books, and uh, the book is just out. My guests tonight are Denise Stoner and Kathleen Martin. And ladies, good evening and welcome to Off Planet Radio. 
Hello. Good evening. Be with you. And uh, it'll be for a while here in the interview. We'll just have to distinguish between the two voices. Um, uh, but yeah, first off, when did the, when was the book released? The book was released on May twentieth. Okay. Just this week. Yeah, that's what I thought. And that was the voice of Kathleen Morden. And my other guest with us is Denise Stoner. Um, of the two of you, um, Denise is an experiencer, an abductee, and Kathleen is the niece of Betty Hill of the uh, 1960s original, I guess, abduction case, Betty and Barney Hill. Um, so let's start off with Kathleen and give us a little bit of your background, Kathleen. Okay. Well, uh, I was born and grew up in the state of New Hampshire. I was 13 years old when my aunt Betty called my mother to tell her that she and my uncle had had a close encounter with a flying saucer in New Hampshire's White Mountains the day before. Uh, there was physical evidence. We went to Betty's and Barney's house within a couple of days of the time of the event and saw the physical evidence, heard the story, and I was always fascinated with that throughout my lifetime. But I uh, grew up, went to college, uh, became a social worker, and then uh, left social work and became uh, a teacher and an education services coordinator. And although I maintained an interest in UFOs and alien abduction, I didn't uh, start researching uh, it full time pretty much until 1990. And that is when uh, I asked my Aunt Betty Hill uh, to turn over her files to me. Uh, I would like to uh, interview her, I would like to investigate. Uh, her abduction and do all of the research I possibly could on it. Uh, over the next 14 years, she turned over about 40 years worth of files, all the original investigation reports, uh, reports to and from scientists, correspondence, information that had never been released before because it was confidential until after Betty's death in 2004. And this was the framework for uh, my book, Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, uh, that Stanton Friedman uh, co-authored. He wrote uh, the two chapters about the star map in that book and assisted me uh, with the book that I had written. And uh, from there, Stan and I wrote the book, Science Was Wrong, and uh, it's interesting, you just mentioned cold fusion. Stan wrote a chapter on cold fusion in mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. I knew that, actually. And that was just one of those interesting synchronicity tie-ins. Uh, yeah, I actually knew that Stan had written, <laughs> had written that article in that book. Yes, and then Ralph Blumenthal had interviewed me for the article in Vanity Fair. There you so go. Now, another. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, and... Uh, I am now a full-time abduction researcher. I also have a, an acute interest in government involvement and government cover-ups in UFOs. And uh, together with Denise, about three and a half years ago, I would say, um, when I moved to Florida, I had always lived in New Hampshire, or at least uh, since the mid 1980s, I grew up there too. But my husband uh, retired to Florida. I can't say I retired, but he did um, about three and a half years ago. I looked up Denise at that time. I'd had some email exchanges with her before that and attended some of her meetings. She holds meetings in Florida for experiencers and also public interest uh, meetings on uh, UFOs. And she invited me to her home at that. And that's when we really got to know each other. And eventually she told me that she had been uh, abducted by a craft 
Uh, she told me about an event she'd had in Colorado, and I'll, I'll let her finish that. But uh, she didn't have a very good memory of the hypnosis sessions that she had had in Colorado uh, following that abduction experience. I'm also uh, a hypnotist with advanced training in aggression and post-traumatic stress disorder, and uh, I offered to help her to refresh her memory. And uh, eventually, uh, it, her story became part of the book. So I'll let uh, Denise go on now. Yeah, Denise, uh, you bring to the table, I guess, what we call the experiential side of the team in terms of abductions that you've undergone. There were there were a number of them over the years, and in fact, I believe, if I read correctly, you're probably a lifetime experiencer as well. Uh, yes, I am, and I have full memory from of childhood. Uh, well, had to me, and it's very, very clear. It's still there, just as if it happened yesterday. Uh, I keep seeing it over and over again, and I think that happens to a lot of people. I just didn't realize that the little creature that I was seeing when I was little wasn't an invisible friend. It was real. It took me a few years to figure that out. And I had someone in Colorado that I worked with he has passed away now. Um, I trusted him a great deal. And I had gone to him actually to work in helping individuals through hypnosis to control crime. And that's what he was doing to begin with. And then we found out we had a mutual interest in UFOs and began to work together. And he taught me his hyp hypnosis techniques at that time. Uh, before I actually took the courses myself. I worked with him for five years. So we began to explore about the same time that Kathleen did, uh, this procedure and it, get, gaining information on what I had been through. And since it was all put on tape at the time, all of that became foggy. Once it was put down, I thought, okay, that's there. I can get it if I need it. What I didn't realize at the time was that we were going to move to Florida. The tape stayed in Colorado, and they were gone. And you didn't have a transcription as well, I take it? No, I did not. He had everything. So I, I had lost through raising children and working full-time all of those kinds of things that life involves you in um, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. had lost all of that yeah how many years did it take you from childhood I'm assuming you were probably five or younger when you had your initial contact experiences two and a half two and a half <laughs> that's the youngest two age I've heard yet <laughs> Yes, um, and I, it's, it's clear, 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 because my mother was in the hospital giving birth to my sister. Ah, that's I know that. Mm -hmm, there was no mm -hmm. doubt in my mind. Mm -hmm. I, I can put right on that night. And my grandfather was taking care of me. He, the, my grandparents lived with us, and they always, they always did. They had come over from Scotland, and they shared a home with my parents always. So he was there taking care of me, and I saw a huge, which I now know was a craft in the sky. I was standing on the sofa, I'm looking out the window, and he was doing the dishes. He fixed dinner for both of us, and I saw just this enormous craft. I thought it was Humpty Dumpty. As a child, that's how your mind works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was so close. It was the uh, walls from the telephone poles were going right across the center of it. And I thought, oh, it's going to fall. I'm empty. It's going to fall. <laughs> and he came through, my grandfather, and I showed him, and I said, what's he doing up in the sky? And I can see the fear registered on his face. That is just as clear today as it was then. And my grandfather wasn't one to fear or any other emotions other than he was happy to be with me. And he showed a few years, closed the window or the curtains and said, come on, we're going to go up and get a bath and get you ready for bed. 
because it was dark already and and he did he took me upstairs we had a bath and then he put me to bed and he went back downstairs i was on the second floor and it was shortly after that i was just lying in bed looking at the nursery rhyme wallpaper all the characters in the nursery rhymes and pretty soon here came a character that was not a part of the nursery rhymes it was a little figure it was hooded and carrying either an instrument or a tool it was lit on one end and the character had great big dark eyes and i figured it was a new nursery rhyme character and he reached out and took my hand and led me bed into the hall and we went right through the wallpaper in the hallway and entered a huge craft when you that think that was my go ahead when you think back on that memory now are you able to kind of engage the mind of the child that you were at that age because it sounds to me like you're very much in touch with the imagery that you had at that age even down to associating it with, with what you would have understood as um, storybook characters and things like that it sounds like you really connect with that person at that time in this experience it's one of the things that I listen for when I talk to people who are contactees I did I even gave him a name from a another nursery rhyme that we don't hear anymore and it was Wee Willie Winky I don't know I rem- yes I do remember I remember that in my storybooks too Okay, that's what I named him. That's who I thought he was. Because I I can't even remember to repeat it, but it was something about upstairs, downstairs. I don't know if it was all through the night, but he he was like a little shadow, and he carried a lantern. And so that's who I thought would come to visit me, never harmed me. I, I just thought he was coming to teach me and to keep me company. I I liked to have someone with me that was more adult. Uh, rather than other children, so this was fantastic for me. So you didn't really have a sense, looking back on this memory now, you didn't really have a sense of fear about this at the time, did you, Denise? No, not at all. Mm -mm. No, I thought it was terrific. And when I, I did try to explain to my parents, I never spoke to my grandfather again about it because I had the fear on his face. But I did speak to my mom, and she thought that I had an invisible friend. That's exactly what she thought. But she went right along with it and said, well, that's terrific. What did you do here? What did you do there? Well, I didn't have the verbiage to say I was taken on a craft. He took me to play, and and we played games, and and that's about all I said at the time. There was a baby sister in the house to be worried about, and it was very brief conversations. Um, Did you continue to have experiences throughout childhood? Did the experiences stop, or do your memories simply drop off at a certain point, Denise? That little figure went away, and we moved into a brand new house that my parents built. And then I was an older child, and then I became afraid because I would find myself standing. It, it was a, a, a New England town, a very quiet town. We never locked our doors. It was more of a Norman Rockwell painting type <laughs> yeah, town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would, I would catch myself standing in the park in the middle of the night that was down the street from us, wondering how I got there. And I would start to run. I was chased by someone that I called the oil can man. I couldn't describe him any other way as an older child from first grade on. And he had an arms that were very long and he could reach and catch me. And I would run. F- and he had something in his hand that would drip some kind of fluid on me. And I would run till I got to my front door and I could get in and get upstairs and no one noticed. I could get into my bed and go to sleep and everybody else in the house was sleeping. And it happened over and over again. And I I recall being on a craft with that individual. They always seemed to put me back in that park, standing in the grass. 
Now, do you have memories of going on to the craft itself and what occurred there at that particular age? I was put on a craft. I remember things developing a little bit further. I think took some skin samplings. I had some things happened to me. I have not researched that under hypnosis, but something made me more afraid. I didn't like that, that chased me. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know what he did. We haven't explored that. So we kind of go forward now. You got through school. Um, you sort of had a... Did you sort of um, transition into what we would call a normal life? And was that fairly uninterrupted by these events, or did they continue? They were not quite as often. I had something happen when we moved from that town to California. And again, I was chased, but this time I was wide awake. I was walking home, and my dad was now working at Aerojet. He had gone into aerospace, and the whole family moved to California, and I was walking down a hill, and I was chased, and ran into a girlfriend's house, and I just discussed this with her the other day. She does not recall it, but she may be developing dementia, and so we don't. She's going to ask her two brothers, because they were there, and we had called a policeman, because whoever it was ran into their backyard and the policeman came out and said I'm I, I can't go back there I don't have any assistance and I'm all done he got in his car and took off wow and yeah so he was frightened uh, obviously but the the whoever it was it was definitely an entity that chased me her dad had asked us to sit down in the living room and we all did our family room by those sliding glass doors facing the backyard and this entity looked in the glass at us mm-hmm. and we all saw it the policeman was in the backyard at the far end we could see the light from its flashlight do you have any rec- so, recollection of what this entity was was it uh, a solid being was it something that was yeah. kind of formless it was solid. No, it was no solid. It was more of what someone would describe as insectoid. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then her dad watched me as I ran home two houses down. And I did tell my mom, and I asked her the other night if she recalled it, and she said yes. She doesn't have a clear memory of it, but she remembers me running home and telling her what had happened that I'd been chased and that the policeman left and what he had said. Listening to your narrative, Denise, and especially the reaction of your grandfather, um, I'm guessing that maybe perhaps this is a generational situation and that maybe even your grandfather may have been aware of what was going on? Or am I making a stretch there? I don't know anything about my grandparents but I do know something might have happened to my mom and my dad Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in that same house and their bedrooms my grandparents and my parents bedrooms were uh, right next to each other and there was a door that opened between the two in the first house that they ever purchased Um, it was an older home and it it was kind of different the, the way it all worked um, they were at one end of the hall, and my parents saw a light coming towards the double windows in their bedroom one night. And my dad had been a gunner in a B-17, so he was real good at space and lights and distance and all that kind of thing. And he, my mom and, and my dad were watching these lights and moving very slowly from the second story of the home. And my dad said to my mom, if that thing doesn't go up or down it's going to hit our house and the next thing they remembered it was morning Mm. so something happened that night and then my mom developed severe agoraphobia 
uh, felt like she was in a tube-like structure if she got on a city bus and panicked um, certain types of lights, different types of things that terrified her for a long time. Following that. So these events basically followed you through your uh, early life and wherever you went. I mean, obviously, California, there's a lot of phenomena there as well. It's a hot spot, as is you later on relocated, I believe, to Colorado. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. To a town first way up in the mountains, it's called Gunnison. It's in the middle of nowhere, virtually. And we sighted a craft there in broad daylight. Um, the people that were living there with us, all in the same uh, apartment complex, all kind of said, well, hey, we see those all the time, type attitude, and went inside when we called them out to, to look at it. And then we moved down to Denver, the Denver area, and that's yeah. when we had the episode that's written in the book. Yeah, let's talk about the episode a little bit in the book, and then let's talk about the book and bring Kathleen back into the narrative as well. The episode in the book not only involved you, but also uh, your husband, correct? Yes, my husband, my daughter, our daughter was sleeping in the back seat of the car, and we had had a little bit of a uh, problem with gas mileage, and my husband had been setting the trip meter for quite a while. And it was a newer car, so we wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything wrong. So this one particular day, he had set the trip meter. We were very used to taking this trip. We had had this place up in the mountains for a long time, and we left at 5 in the evening, packed the car with everything we took for a time that we would stay for three days and we were leaving from like I said the Denver area my parents were leaving with a long time family friend from Colorado Springs and we had told them as we usually did we'll be there right around 8 o'clock somewhere in there 8.15 no later and we always did that so they didn't have to worry about us their trip was a little shorter than ours Mm -hmm. So we headed out, and there's usually heavy traffic. Everybody wants out of town um, in Denver on a Friday night. <laughs> yeah. Or even a Thursday night. They leave early, and, and so there was a little bit of heavy traffic. Until we got to an area called Kenosha Pass. And you can look down from Kenosha Pass and see a glacier valley. Sunlight streaming across it at the bottom of it was a little town called Jefferson. And for some reason, I always watched that little town. I liked to see it at the base of the pass. So I was watching, and I looked out across the high desert, and I could see two lights. And I had never seen them before. And they appeared to be moving really slowly, and I thought it was some strange anomaly caused by the sunlight at first. And then I began to realize, no, I, let's figure out what that is. But my husband and I were just talking, chatting away, enjoying the evening that was coming on. And I guess you'd say it was early evening. And, and so um, the sun was even glinting off the snow at the far side, and that's where we were headed. So we came through Jefferson. And up at the base of the pass, and about four miles outside Jefferson, I noticed those lights were approaching us pretty fast. I could not see anything attached to them. They were, even with the sun shining, they were terribly bright. And they came up over the top of the car, and I turned to try to say something to my husband again, and he was staring straight ahead and was clutching the steering wheel, and he wasn't responding. It was like he just didn't know what mm -hmm. was going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His eyes were wide open, but he wasn't reacting to anything. So I leaned over to my right and leaned on the passenger side window and looked up, and the lights were right there. And as I did that, I felt the tires on the driver's side start to scrape on the road. And I thought, uh-oh, the car's moving sideways. This isn't good. We had big snow barriers at the time made of wood. They were tall. 
and they were meant to block any blowing snow or tumbleweeds that grew over five feet tall, which they did, and would break off at night and blow across the road, causing accidents. Mm -hmm. And I thought, we're going to hit those barriers, and we're going to get in an accident, so I don't know what's causing this. And there was no wind that night. So all of a sudden, I'm watching the barriers, and I thought, we're going to hit them. And the car lifted up and went over the top of the barriers. And we headed out over the high desert. And I was looking around and looking at my husband. My daughter was still asleep. And I could see all the way across that desert. The sun was shining. And I couldn't see anything except knowing there was that object with the lights over the car. We went way out in that high desert. And then the car started to slow down. And I knew we were going to stop. I didn't know why. I didn't know what was going to happen. I did not relate it to any of my past. And then the car came to a stop. I felt it settle down. The next thing I knew, we were on Trout Creek Pass on the other side of the Glacier Valley. And we were up high on top of the pass. I looked around. I was panicking. I was afraid. I was disoriented. My husband had come to. He was in the same state I was. And it was pitch dark. And it should still have been somewhat light out. He looked at the trip meter. It hadn't changed. It had not moved. It read the same as it had when we left Kenosha Pass. He said, let's pull over. We need to get our wits about us. We need to try and figure out what just happened. I was saying, what the heck just happened here? So we pulled over. Our daughter was okay. Little dog was okay. We were not okay. (laughs) Um, He hadn't realized that we were lifted off the road. He just was searching blindly for some answer something that he couldn't remember at all and then we decided we better get going my parents are waiting for us so we headed on there were another nine or so miles to go to where we camped and when we got there my parents and friend were waiting they had walked to the ranch house they were going to use the phone to start calling the police and hospital and then my dad and friend were going to get in the car and drive our path to see if we'd gone off the cliff or if we were stuck somewhere on the road because there were no cell phones and no phones on that whole route we had taken. And they asked us, where have you been? What's gone on? Did you get stuck at home? or did you? What happened? And the only answer we could give was, we don't know. And my dad, being in aerospace, kind of said, well, I guess we can't do anything but accept that. Maybe we'll have to talk about it some more. We'll have to think about it. My mom always had to have an answer from me. She would not accept that kind of answer. So she kept at us. You've got to have an answer. You've got to give me an answer. I have a need to know. And and we just still came up with, don't know. We really don't know. And that's what happened. It's unbelievable as it sounds. And it, you know, it, it is unbelievable to anybody who's not aware of what goes on with these type of abductions. Your husband was actually put into some sort of state even as he was driving that car. Does he have any recollection, any memory at all? Has he had regression or anything done to try and capture that period of time as he was going into that state? Kathleen has worked with him to the degree that he will allow, and you can ask her what happened, because we didn't want either of our stories to get involved or mixed up at all. We did not discuss it, and she handled that. Okay. Is that something we want to discuss at this juncture, or do we just want to let that go? It doesn't matter. Um, Kathleen can. Kathleen, do you do you want to do you want to weigh in here with what you may know about that? Sure, I can. Um, well, 
after a long time after I had hypnotized uh, Denise, and uh, I want to say that uh, I had instilled uh, amnesia again for uh, many of of uh, her memories. She hadn't discussed it, anything that she remembered with Ed, and uh, I wanted to compare notes. I wanted to know uh, if perhaps what Denise had stated under hypnosis uh, matched up with what Ed would state under hypnosis. And so uh, he agreed uh, to permit me to hypnotize him as long as I didn't push him too far and uh, he didn't want to re-experience any trauma or being on board the craft uh, if, in fact, he actually was. So uh, I did hypnotize him. He did uh, tell me in great detail, and I've put this into the book, uh, his statements about his trip uh, up to the point where uh, there was something in the sky that Denise had had drawn his attention to it and that uh, he then felt himself sort of sliding off the road. And the next thing he knew, as if only a moment had passed, he was 40 miles down the road. Uh, It had been. He'd checked the the time. It was nearly 7 o'clock p.m. when uh, he found himself in the new location on Trout Creek Pass. It was nearly 11 o'clock. He was freezing Uh, He was upset, startled, uh, just shaking his head, couldn't figure out what had gone on. And then I took him back and I to to open up that lost memory. And he recalled finding himself in uh, a different environment. He was uh, lying down on some kind of a, a. a slab, mm-hmm. perhaps. He was in uh, a room that seemed to have a domed ceiling, and it was dark, and he felt terribly lonely, uh, not knowing where he was and or when uh, he would move on. And that was about all that he wanted to remember. And so then uh, I, I didn't push him to go beyond that. But it gave me an indication that it seemed that he was probably in a room on that craft with Denise, but or in some kind of just uh, state of suspended animation somewhere. It didn't appear that he was inside the car any longer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... Based on the information that you got from that regression, he himself was or was not the subject of this particular abduction? I can't say for certain. Uh, We know that he woke up in in an environment that was different Mm -hmm. than the one he had been in. He had been driving a vehicle. Uh, He then realized he was disoriented. He realized he was in a new location. Um, He thought that Denise was drawing his attention to a house that was under construction. But, uh, you know, instantly he found himself somewhere else. He's in a new environment and he sees a smooth, dull, reflective dome ceiling overhead. Uh, at, which is very similar to Denise's description of the examining room on the craft. Um, and he's now only sensing a feeling of detachment and waiting for an extended period of time. He doesn't know where Denise or his daughter are. Uh, he finally hears a frequency in a tenor range that reminds him of loud tinnitus. There's a heavy pulsation, and he feels frightened and cold. Uh, His weight then returns. He finds himself clinging to his steering wheel. It's suddenly dark outside, and he's freezing. His headlights are on, but he hadn't turned them on. He realizes that he's halfway up Trout 
uh, Creek Pass. It's nearly 11 o'clock, and he said Denise is freaking out. They stopped for a few minutes to gather their thoughts and attempt to discern uh, what had just happened to them. Neither could explain it. So he literally returned to consciousness, and the vehicle is moving. Is that correct? Yes. See, this is the kind of detail that I find intriguing because uh, so rarely do we get a chance to hear those kind of nuances. Um, having interviewed abductees for a number of years and talked to people, um, I get a lot of details, but this is probably one of the more detailed accounts that I've heard, and it's those little nuances in the narrative that make it not only just believable but a fascinating case in terms of being able to actually visualize what was going on here how about uh, Denise's daughter do we do we have an account from her as well um, yes I don't well I, Kathleen can, can own in too but I don't think uh, Deanna was taken because she just knew that she was supposed to take her medication at a certain time at night. She's very good at that. She's mildly handicapped. And she wondered what we had been up to that kept her from getting to camp on time in order to take her medication. Okay. And I don't know if she said anything else to Kathleen. Do you recall? Uh, no, no. She didn't remember being taken. <laughs> So, and, and I'm also very interested in the flow of conversation here because I'm learning a little bit about how investigations work, Kathleen. There, in reading your book, I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in how people research this type of information. You do seem to be able to compartmentalize things in a way that you're not leaking information, which would, I guess, contaminate memories and things like that. Is that correct? That is correct. I make an, uh, it a point not to contain memories. So, now, this was, uh, correct me on the dates here, is this like, what, 1984 or so this event occurred? 1982. Okay. It was August 13th, Friday. What a thing to happen on Friday the 13th. <laughs> <laughs> So, this is quite a gap in time from when you and Kathleen uh, connected with each other in Florida. In the intervening years, anything remarkable happened? Did you continue to have experiences? Uh, yes, we did. Um, we moved to Florida. I took up scuba diving with my husband. We became instructors. And that wasn't good enough for me. I dragged him into the caves. And we, just, we took up underwater cave diving. In order to do that, we had to go to North Florida, where a lot of the sinks are. The Florida aquifer opens up to the surface in a lot of places in North Florida. So we had begun to go up there and found some favorite places. And... We began to go there almost every single weekend because we knew we were older cave divers at that point. And at the time, there were very, very, maybe five women that were cave divers. And mm -hmm. no one had even seen one when I started that till I came to the surface one day and they discovered I was a woman when I took my head off, my um, uh, hood off. And um, we were actually taken on the way to go diving it happened twice but we've documented one and that time um, Kathleen worked with my husband and he did see an entity return me to our truck and she can describe that but he drew it for her and then I drew pretty much the identical entity and um, just before that just prior to that we both witnessed craft sitting in the farmer's field because on the way to these dive sites you don't go by specific directed signs you actually have to say oh you turn left at the white fence and right at the farmer's field and that's how you find these sinkholes so that's what we were doing so you have two descriptions from two different people that match, but you and your husband never discussed this between yourselves. Is that correct? 
No, and uh, the reason that we didn't is because I was already in the UFO field, and I knew how to investigate, and I knew exactly what would happen if we did. We would say to each other, it happened again. It just happened again, didn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. And we would say, yes, it did. Okay, we, let's draw what we saw. So we did that a couple of times as far as the craft went and then we discovered there was a particular sense in our brains that would indicate we might be affected by something that was going to take us because once on our way back from a trip my mom happened to be following us with our daughter in the car and our car just pulled off the road and ended up in a dirt road that was a back gate to one of our state parks and we felt that feeling in our heads we were going to be taken my mom pulled in behind us and the feeling went completely away we looked at each other and said we were going to be taken and they know your mother's here and it stopped you just said something interesting and i want to follow this a little bit the feeling that we're going to be taken can you describe that oh boy is that difficult it's in the brain, I, mm -hmm. as far as we're, we're concerned, as far as we know. It's a sensation in the brain, something that tells you you're going to be taken. It's coming, and you're not going to be able to stop it. It's just there. It's just kind and of a, like a start, knowing? Um, I would say uh, it's almost like you're going to hear a voice, but you don't. It's almost a electric or a uh, buzzing type feeling. Okay, got, yeah, I got pressure. it. I got it. That's what I was I was going to ask you that. Did you sense some like feel some electrical sensation? I would have to say again centered in the brain. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that's something that it's again one of those little nuances, but whenever I hear it, I I like to pursue it as much as possible because it's one of those to me ring of truth type things that says yeah you know this is this is for real and i know you both kind of share the same thing that many other people who are working in this field whether they're researchers investigators experiencers contactees whatever the frustration comes with the fact that we're dealing with subjects where there is no so-called hard, tangible evidence, and it's great frustration for a lot of people. Um, as researchers, you both deal with that ambiguity of information that, other than uh, maybe photographs that people get of marks on their body and, and some of the documented evidence that I've seen over the years, there is no way that you can lead a, a, what I'll call a skeptic uh, kindly to the conclusion that what you're saying has a ring of truth is that something that is now kind of ingrained into your narrative in terms of expressing yourself and also in the way you research I hope that question came out clearly I, well Kathleen I think can describe something we've discovered that's very very new to us and we're going to be able to approach that in a whole new way because I was taken again in February and something happened to Kathleen at the same time that mm -hmm. affected both of our vehicles and affected me physically and we've got video or, of it mm -hmm. so Kathleen you want to explain that a little bit Yes, I will explain it, but first I wanted to state that uh, we have eyewitness testimony uh, from both Ed, from Denise, and from Denise's mother that something happened that night, and, and eyewitness testimony is uh, important as well. Uh, we know that 40 miles was lost. We know that there's no prosaic explanation uh, for that is acceptable mm -hmm. for what a that night but uh, moving on uh, as Denise is continuing to e experience these events uh, we are we have the capability now to get on the case immediately and Denise did have an experience on February 2nd of this year 
the two of us had been driving. My father was with us. We went to a meeting in St. Pete, Florida, and we drove then back to uh, Winter Garden, uh, a couple of hours drive where Denise was going to pick up her car and continue on to her house, and I was going to continue on to my home, which was uh, probably about three quarters of an hour for each of us both ways. Uh, along the route on the way home, some strange things started to occur. My car's GPS system started to malfunction. It kept uh, wanting me to turn off the highway. Uh, I did, in fact, at one point and realized that I shouldn't have done that and got back on the highway. Uh, Denise's uh, telephone that had been fully charged suddenly went dead. Uh, she yeah. has an insulin pump. She had a three-month battery life on that insulin pump. It was fully charged. It went dead. So those were a couple of important things that, that I observed. Um, when she returned to her car, uh, something was malfunctioning. First, it was her... Uh, Rear view, not the rear, the exterior mirror on the driver's side. Um, and so she got into the car, she's driving home, and suddenly she finds herself on a new road that she hadn't been on and doesn't know how she arrives there. She has the experience. Uh, she calls me the following day and tells me that something has happened. To her the night before and she tells me everything that she can remember well Denise has a tri-field meter and there was a problem with the dashboard equipment after that as well so she was able to take the tri-field meter out to her vehicle and she discovered that there was a strong uh, electromagnetic field around the dashboard and that exterior mirror on her car mm -hmm. I wanted to see that, too, so uh, she did bring the car over to my house a few days later, and I was um, able to observe um, what the malfunctioning of the equipment, uh, but a very strange thing happened that uh, suddenly it started working again that afternoon uh, when she was ready to go home. Now, I did hypnotize her that day but one thing that I wanted to mention that was really important to me it was this is a new discovery I believe uh, we set the tri-field meter to different settings I wanted to see if uh, there was an electromagnetic field coming from her body and uh, what we discovered is we turned it to the electrical field reading and when Denise Got within 10 feet of that electrical field reading, the needle went to full capacity and the trimeter sounded that it was at full capacity. Now, we tested this with other people as well. We tested it with my husband and it didn't move. And we had the meter in the same place. We moved it to different locations in the house. Denise took off her jewelry, took off anything that might have caused that to happen. It still continued to arc to full capacity. Uh, Denise took it home. She tried it with her husband. She tried it with her daughter. Uh, the same results as with my husband, that it just uh, moved slightly, indicating any human has a little bit of an electrical right, field. Right, right, but Hers that's, was very That's strong. off the scale um, for, for it to move to capacity? I mean, and you mean she pushed that meter the whole way over? She absolutely did. And okay. it makes a noise when it goes yes, to yes, full Yes, yes, I'm very familiar with the meter. All the way yeah. over. Yeah. And her body did that. And it stayed that way for a couple of weeks, at least before it started to uh, decrease. So did you also get similar readings from the, the vehicle itself, or was it simply... Now, this, this is interesting. The vehicle itself was registering one anomaly, but she was registering this anomaly, almost like her body was a capacitor holding an electrical field. Yes. 
Yes, that is true. And and I discussed this. Uh, I was I was out in Phoenix, Arizona, for the International uh, UFO Congress. Right. Uh, and I discussed this with uh, Dr. Roger Lear's uh, science, material scientist, Stephen Colburn. Yeah. And I said, could you explain why this is happening? It's happened twice now to two different uh, experiencers that I've worked with. And uh, he said that it would make sense that if a person had been in an alien environment, that that would occur. This would also explain why various experiencers tend to have electrical and electronic anomalies around them. Denise, uh, you uh, undoubtedly have experienced electrical anomalies, blowing out light bulbs, things like that? Yes. Yeah, I have. And now I'm just playing, I'm blowing the fuses in my car radio. I can't keep them running and there's nothing else wrong with that car and it then stops and the radio works just fine so we you now have the ability to uh basically follow up kathleen with denise when she has another one of these encounters were you able to do any regression work uh in terms of recapturing memories from that february 2nd event Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and Denise told me that uh, as she relived this in hypnosis, that um, she, as she was driving along, an ET stepped out uh, from behind a, a stand of trees. Uh, her car stopped, and she was taken uh, aboard a craft. Uh, she was taken into a room and a, a, a short procedure was done uh, it, it did not take a long period of time she observed two other humans on the craft as well and uh, they were she got caught just a glimpse of them uh, there was a woman and an older man who appeared to uh, be balding and uh, she wasn't able to identify them. In fact, this sort of piqued my curiosity because uh, my father is an older balding man and, and I was in the car with her that night and so we were wondering, gee, did uh, they pick the three of us up <laughs> when we before? And, uh, you know, so we have no answer to that she, because she only caught a glimpse of, of those people and couldn't identify us. So they probably were not my father and myself. Um, but it was interesting nevertheless. But she just had uh, just a short procedure it might have been just changing an implant, for example, um, from the way she described it, and then uh, was taken back to her car and was on her way. You mentioned, well, let me ask you this, Kathleen, do you believe that you're also an experiencer? Well, I don't know. I'm pretty curious about this. It could certainly the possibility exists because uh, it does run in, in family. Right. And, and, uh, and of course, my Aunt Betty was conducting uh, contact experiments uh, with a team of scientists back in the 1960s in order to attempt a vector in a craft. And when she was doing these experience, uh, these experiments, uh, we started to have close encounters ourselves. Uh, I grew up across the street from my grandparents' farm in Kingston, New Hampshire, and Betty was attempting to vector the craft into my grandparents' farm. And there was a landing during that time frame when I was still living at my parents' house. And... Uh, there was physical trace evidence left on the ground. One of our neighbors was a commercial pilot. He was returning home at night. He saw the craft coming in. It woke my grandparents up, and they observed it, uh, pretty frightened by it, but it was sitting out there on the ground. And then, after that occurred, we started to have paranormal activity in my childhood home, and we had never heard that before. 
and it was poltergeist activity. It was light orbs uh, shooting through the air as well. And, uh, you know, it was a little uh, unsettling for my family to suddenly have this occur. And what really has sparked my curiosity is that 88% of the experiencers that participated in the Martin Stoner commonality study stated that they had paranormal activity in their homes. Mm -hmm. And over half of them stated that it occurred for the first time after their experience. I think when we come, we're going to take a break here for a few minutes. When we come back, I'd like to pursue that a little bit more. I also would like to discuss a little bit more about the book and some of the other people that you write about in the book. The book is The Alien Abduction Files. It's written by Kathleen Martin and Denise Stoner. And uh, you guys want to give out your websites and book information at this point, let people know where they can find you and where they can get the book. Sure. Um, my website is Kathleen, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N, hyphen or dash, Marden, M-A-R-D-E-N, dot com. You can also, uh, you can get autographed copies of the, the book at the website. I have several articles there and also a list of all of my speaking engagements this year. Uh, you can purchase the book uh, at Amazon. Dot com or barnesandnoble.com. It is now in bookstores everywhere, and it is now available on Kindle as well. And why don't you go ahead, Denise? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can purchase an autographed copy through my website also, which is denisemisonmargaretstoner.com, and I'll be listing uh, some places where I'll be speaking and holding my private abductee meetings. Excellent. Uh, I'll take a break here. It'll probably be about seven minutes or so. So, uh, you know, if you guys want to go take a, a rest break in the meantime, we'll come back on the other side. We're going to talk more about the alien abduction files and what really is going on out there in the world of abductions. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio. We'll be back in a couple of minutes.
And welcome back to the second hour of Off Planet Radio Live for May 22nd, 2013, 22. Always, it's always one of those synchronistic numbers. The, uh, the whole concept of synchronicity fascinates me beyond uh, what I can even describe sometimes. Um, it's kind of one of those things that I notice people who have paranormal experiences talk about. And uh, maybe we can find out a little bit more about that with my guests, Kathleen Martin and Denise Stoner. The book is The Alien Abduction Files, the most startling cases of human-alien contact ever reported. This is a resource book if you're serious about ufology. It's one of those that you need to have in your library. We're just touching the surface tonight, but I think we're also getting some fresh information as well. Kathleen and Denise, welcome back to the second hour. Good to be back. Yeah, the, the phone lines have been uh, really, really strange tonight, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll muddle through it. I was talking uh, when I came in on the intro about synchronicities and anomalies, and this is something that is uh, always an interesting part of the experiencer's life. Can you talk a little bit about that, and can you talk a little bit about... I, I don't know if you understand what I mean by synchronicities or not, but maybe you can address that if, if that's part of your experience. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because I started the introduction with the synchronicity of how Denise and I met and discovered that uh, at one point she had lived in Gunnison, Colorado, and I had lived only about 30 miles away from her in Crested Butte, Colorado, and that we might have observed the same UFO at the same time. Uh, so we found that we had some things in common uh, there. But there's also an incredibly synchronous event uh, in the own abduction files that we wrote about, and that is that Denise and Jen, uh, Jenny Henderson, who is the second experiencer in the book of several experiences we wrote about, but Jenny's case is just as extensive as Denise's. And um, we discovered, or I discovered actually, as I was working with both women separately, I had worked with Jenny when I was in New Hampshire for uh, a period of, oh, at least a dozen years. And she had told me uh, about a, something that came to her as kind of a dreamlike experience. And she didn't know if it was real or not or if it was only a dream, but she had found herself on a large craft in a mountainous area. And she uh, was very frightened. She uh, had, the ETs apparently had trusted her, um, and, but she tried to evade them and went to hide in a room. So she described uh, all of the experience to me, and, and all of it is in the book. Uh, but as I was working with Denise, I had never mentioned Jenny. Denise knew nothing about Jenny or her experiences. And Denise started to tell me about an event that she had uh, in a mountainous area on a craft that she described as exactly like the craft that Jenny described. And then she told me about a woman who appeared to be frightened and who uh, attempted to escape. Uh, and she was holding the hand of a younger woman. And uh, I asked Denise to describe what Jenny was wearing. And then I went back and asked Jenny to describe what um, individuals that she had observed on the craft. And come to find out, they both had the clothing uh, that was described. And later, Jenny and Denise met. And uh, we think that there's a good possibility that they might have been on the same craft at the same time. 
and so there's kind of almost like a perfect triangulation between you, Kathleen, Denise is the experiencer, and Jenny, who is the person you write about in the book. Um, let's go into a little bit about Jenny's case history, how you came to um, handle that particular investigation, and why it is that Jenny does not present her story personally. Okay. Well, uh, Jenny is a young woman. She grew up in, in New Hampshire. She's not young anymore. Um, but um, when she was a teenager, she had uh, a missing time event when she was in a vehicle uh, driving to a high school event uh, after she had a close encounter with a UFO. When she arrived at the high school event, it had ended. And she had a, about a two-hour period of missing time. After that, she started to have bedroom abduction events and eventually uh, went to Dr. James Harder. She had contacted him through my Aunt Betty Hill. So there's a little more synchronicity there. And uh, Jim had hypnotized her. Now, Jim Harder, James, Dr. James Harder, is a, a professor um, at the uh, University of uh, California. And he was also uh, a chief investigator, head investigator for um, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization um, and was very, a very, very active um, abduction researcher. And he was the one who originally made the connection um, the, between experiences and the fact that it appears to follow family genetic lines. Um, so he um, and Betty worked with Jenny for uh, a period of time, and I wasn't even aware of her case. But uh, over time, she had sort of lost contact with my aunt, wasn't uh, seeing her as often. And I had been speaking in New Hampshire. Uh, people were coming to know who I was and, and my name. I was teaching courses in uh, the history of UFO abductions at uh, the Exeter High School. And uh, Jenny found me. And she uh, called me up and, and uh started talking to me about her events, and she didn't want a formal investigation. She knew that I was uh, an investigator for the Mutual UFO Network at that time. I was also the uh, director of field investigator training at that time, and, but we just uh, investigated her case kind of quietly and, and privately. She didn't want anyone to know her identity, and she still does not. Uh, she's married to a successful businessman, prominent in the community. She's very concerned about uh, her reputation, uh, her family's uh, financial well-being, uh, very concerned if this uh, got out to the public that it could simply destroy their credibility and their business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so for that reason, uh, she has asked me not to... It's kind of sad, adapt. isn't it? Isn't it sad that this is the taboo that we now deal with? All the barriers in our culture that have broken down over the last 40 years, this is really the big taboo now, isn't it? It really is. It very much is. And, and so many people uh, still feel the need to hide their identities um, for their own well-being. Because people who uh, do reveal their identities uh, have a history of being attacked, either uh, by debunkers or by even skeptical UFO investigators. Uh, and by members of the, the public, it, it's just not very pleasant for a lot of people. But I think we're moving forward. I think that, uh, like Denise said the other night, that she hasn't been attacked yet, which is a very good thing. Well, and, uh, that's one of the reasons why I cited that VanityFair.com article 
uh, at the beginning of the show because while that is their online presence and that's not an article that was printed in their hard copy magazine, it indicates that we are moving this conversation slowly and gradually out into a public that maybe is now a little bit more capable of accepting this after all these years. Yes, I hope so. I hope that that is the case. I mean, you're but sort of I a... Tell you, I received an email message tonight from a man who's challenging the Betty and Barney Hill story that has more evidence than any other case in the history of abductions. So, I mean, you still have some nasty people out there who... Uh, are are going to say no this didn't happen these people uh, are mentally ill or these people have personality disorders and uh, there is a noisy uh, group of negativists who will continue to say that sort of thing so Denise in your life right now as a disclosed experiencer who now has uh, published these uh, experiences in a book uh, and obviously mm-hmm. the book's just starting to hit what do you foresee as the fallout potentially in your life do you believe that you maybe have uh, accepting people around you or that you maybe just enjoy a certain level of protection from the type of scorn that's usually heaped upon people who disclose oh boy <laughs> well when I decided to disclose, it was because I retired and because I have an awful lot of people around me that are very supportive of what I do and what I chose to do. Whether they believe in this or not, uh, wherever their coping mechanism is and, and what they choose or decide they believe in, they still support what I'm doing. Um, whether they're a part of what I'm doing or not. It just didn't matter to them. It's very difficult for me to put all this into words. Almost every single one of my friends have purchased the book. Whether they believed or not, they want to read what I have written. They want to be more supportive because they have never found that I have told a lie to them in my lifetime uh, co-workers that have now purchased the book and are going to read it and, and tell me what they think and what they feel and some of them who I never mentioned this to before I've had to warn them look out there's a book coming out and some of them that have already read it and said do you mean to tell me you lived with this and never mentioned a word to me and I said that's exactly right so you're going to have to decide what you think. I'm prepared for everything, but so far, none of them have thrown me under the bus. Well, that in itself is actually kind of encouraging because I have a lot of people in the background that I talk to and people that correspond with me who will not disclose publicly at this time because of pressures in their lives, and I understand that. But... um, you know, I mean, we've got to get to the point. I, well, do either one of you have the sense, and I'll direct this to you, Denise, because you are an experiencer. Do you have the sense that the entities, the beings uh, themselves, desire this disclosure? I mean, is, do you have any sense of that at all? I would have to say that I do not. I almost have to say that they're letting us muddle through this on our own we're going to have to make a decision and yet at the same time I have a funny feeling there's some government involvement perhaps with these ETs holding some of it back do you know anything have either of you researched or understood anything about a a so called treaty that was made back in the 1950s as a result I think it was during Eisenhower administration as a result of a meeting with ETs out at Edwards Air Force Base are you either one of you aware of agreements that potentially were made between what I will call the uh, black ops side of our government and so called malevolent ETs both of I have them. read, and Laura Eisenhower yes. has made that statement that her, her grandfather uh, was involved in this. But, uh, boy, I mean, what can I say? 
I, I don't know anything more except for what has been stated by Laura Eisenhower and what I have read. And then also, Kathleen, you and I listened to Paul Hellyer regarding that matter just a couple of weekends ago. Yeah. Yeah. And that was very fascinating. Yeah, Paul Hellyer may be the missing link in all of this uh, because he had background discussions as in his uh, various seats in the Canadian government with uh, sitting secretaries of uh, defense and secretaries of state. And so, you know, slowly this has leaked out. I mean, I've interviewed people like Bob Dean, who has told me flat out, you know, we knew about this in 1962, that there were reports that were circulated then about alien presence. I mean, Bob Dean told me flat out that there are ETs walking the hallways of the Pentagon. I mean, that's a pretty brazen statement, but he's stuck to that statement consi consistently over the years. Yes, and I, we had a member of our family who used to disappear on a regular basis and found out years later, he actually wrote a quote for me for high school that had to do with aerospace, and the teachers wanted to know where I got the photographs that I had, um, and I couldn't, I couldn't give that information out. And this individual also worked for Area 51. He's passed away now, and he told me many times and told my husband this exists I've met an ET and it just happens I've been in a craft he told me how ill he got he told me what happened and you could spend five minutes at a time in there you had to come out and they were trying to figure out how they could spend longer and longer periods of time in the craft and I, I flat believed him I knew the man enough years to know he was telling me the truth and also a military man uh, who was retired but uh, I cannot reveal his identity and he refused to even make a deathbed statement uh, in, in writing he told me that uh, the military knows far more about this than we are aware of, uh, and there there is involvement between the military and the ETs, and, and that's about all he told me. What is your opinion of this recent citizens' disclosure hearings that have, that were held? Do you did you see any of the proceedings from that? Do you have any uh, thoughts about what came out of that? I purchased a live streaming video and watched as much of it as I possibly could, and uh, boy, the, I, I was most impressed by um, the all of the pilots who and and the men who were at the nuclear uh, facilities uh, who were there testifying, and uh, particularly. Um, people, uh, Colonel uh, Halt and uh, the, the people who were involved in the Rendlesham Forest case who uh, became ill after being near that craft and whose medical records are classified and they, they can't even acquire their medical records. I think that the former Congress people who were present were impressed by that kind of testimony. And I think that, you know, eventually they began to take it very, very seriously and said that they would like to uh, see uh, testimony before the United Nations, uh, a conference before the United Nations. So I'm very hopeful that that will occur. I have a question that came up in our chat room, and I think this is directed to Denise. The question is, what beings are you in contact with? Are they always the same ones, and are you having a full awake contact? Oh, yes, I have had several full awake contacts, and um, one main one that's been with me all my life, it's the same one, and he's a tall gray. He's got some of the features that Kathleen and I just changed to suit what I know exactly he looks like. And, and he looks like a gray, but he's got a little uh, slight difference in the features. They're a little bit fuller than what some people draw, the, the little pointy chin. And, you know, it's, this one has rounded features, but he is a gray. And he's a little taller. He's not three foot. 
he's more like five foot, a little over five foot tall, and he's always been there. I, I would call him my, my guide, my escort. And the other one is definitely insectoid. I call him the doctor, and he's done the majority of the medical procedures that have been done on me on the craft. He has always been there um, over and over again. The others I just call the soldiers. They're the smaller grays, and they seem to line the hallways as far as how I see them. I saw one other, and others have seen this one, and he's got a strange shape or form to his legs. And is this an insectoid? I'm not sure. Kathleen has had him drawn where he, he stands. It's a funny stance, and it's his legs are shaped like the letter M. And he Almost kind of like bow-legged, I, if I remember uh, the, the, the graphic. Kind of. Yeah. But he has an odd gait. And I think I've seen that one, and he actually cannot go through the wall, but through glass, and, and kind of, it's almost a hop, and he walks almost sideways, doesn't stand up straight. And Kathleen, what do you know about that one? That's what I've seen, and only once or twice. Yes, and, and that's the one that most people will uh, describe as either being insectoid or uh, a praying mantis type of being. And something that really impressed me about the way that Denise described him under hypnosis is that he had extremely thin uh, arms and legs, uh, but arthritic looking joints. They were very, very large uh, joints and that its head uh, turned in a very unusual fashion, uh, not like a human head. Uh, and as she described it, she would hold her chin and try to make her head uh, move in, in that fashion and just simply couldn't do it. Uh, do you remember that, Denise? Can you describe that? Yeah, the head, the neck was very thin and it was almost like a, a hip joint if you want to think of it that way that the head should be able to swivel more on that joint than I could do with my own and it's not like an owl either it's very difficult to describe and the eyes are strange they're extremely different uh, they, they blink but it's not eyelids it's do they have round eyes or are they uh, no they're elliptical? No. They're, they're pointy at each end, up and down. Not horizontal, but up and down and very narrow. Okay. And they come very close to you. So I had a, a flashback while I was in an MRI machine where the techs were staring in at me and became those creatures because the sound, the whole atmosphere of this MRI thing was just like the sound in a craft and the people standing outside it flashed back to those entities and reached inside the machine and it just became the craft for me and I couldn't tell them it was very frightening you're saying that the inside of an MRI is very similar to what you're experiencing inside of a, of a UFO Yes, the sound inside the sound. an MRI machine is about as close as you can get to one of the sounds inside a craft. Yes. That actually makes a fair amount of sense, given that we're, we're talking about, probably in both cases, some form of electromagnetic power. Um, and that's one of the aspects to your book you talk about a little bit. You want to talk a little bit about uh, what you believe is behind the alien technology? Well, that, uh, th there are actually a couple of different kinds. The larger craft that I was taking in is not run by that method at all. There may be magnetics involved, but the center core affected me so horrifically that it, my muscles and my nerves were involved. And mm -hmm. it was very painful. And as I approached the doorway, it started... I started to react and I was under hypnosis as I was shown this and Kathleen recognized that I was in pain and that I was having some sort of 
uh, a body movement that didn't look normal at all and I was in some discomfort and she stopped that by suggesting that I calm down and just observe the situation and to be able to tell her what I was seeing and then when she brought me out of hypnosis I decided after a period of time that I wanted to do this again. I wanted to feel the whole thing and I wanted it videotaped. I wanted to see for myself what it looked like because I had brought back some of that in real life and they can't diagnose it. They don't know the doctors what it is and they haven't been able to see it. And I wanted to see if it looked under hypnosis. So she videotaped it and took it back. Well, I have a question. I yeah, go ahead. I was going to just add that Denise gave me permission to play that video. Uh, I lecture uh -huh. in Roswell you know, over the July 4th weekend, and also at the Sisters Speak Conference in Portland, Maine in September. They're both listed on my website. Yeah, we're we're experiencing massive phone line problems right now, so I'm, I may have to, you know, sometimes ask you or re-ask you a question. I don't know what's going on with our phone lines, but they're degrading. Um, I have a follow-up question in the chat room. Uh, when you are in telepathic communication, assuming that you are, do they or are they a... a are, are there questions, I'm sorry, this question's phrased kind of awkwardly, is there a back and forth between you and them in terms of uh, impressions that you received, Denise? Uh, some of the time, I don't usually think or feel like I can ask a lot of questions. I certainly can let them know that I'm afraid or let them know, get the point across, why am I here, when am I going home, that type of thing. I'm going to try and change that if I'm taken again. Um, I'm more curious as to what's going on. Also, what am I going to be shown next? What is this all about? Definitely that happens. Their information to me it can be a rapid download. There's so much pumped into my brain that I can't get out. Something stops it. Or they need to tell me that they're going to be doing a procedure and it gets across really quickly and I know what it is, I know what's going to happen, and that's the end of it. Okay, I hope that... They're not, con yeah, they're not conversationalists at all. Okay, so there's not a lot of back and forth in terms of them explaining things to you, but do do they do they sense that you're curious about things? Do they address that in any way? I'm sure by the questioning look on a face that I have seen a couple of times, a look like what is this being or human feeling? What is this person sensing? It was almost like they were studying me. Um, but it wasn't addressed, not in any shape or form. And I am sure that they knew I had questions. I had feelings of why is this happening to me? Here we go again, that type of thing. But it was never mentioned. Uh there was a, an area that I wanted to go into a little bit and in your book and I may be wrong because I know that both of you as researchers while you are very thorough and um, I would say very receptive of people's experiences you both have what I consider to be a healthy skeptical edge and that's not an insult I believe skepticism is a healthy thing I think what you get in terms of scoffers out there or cynics who are basically uh, COINTELPRO people who are hitmen against experiencers. But one of the things that I didn't see addressed in the book was have you explored at all the potential links between experiencers and the military? And the reason I ask this is because it's, it's a pattern that I've noted. Um, Denise, you said your father worked in the aerospace industry. You also worked in the defense industry as well, didn't you? Yes, I did. I, um, I don't go a lot into that because we've had some recent possible interference mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we 
decided not to discuss that that okay. link for a while to see if it stops. Got it. Got it. <laughs> you answered my question. Thank you. That was perfect answer. <laughs> it was done it, done well. Um, it is one of those areas that I research because it's something that I've noted for a long time. Um, we're, we're coming up on a you know about the last few minutes of the show tonight and uh, maybe both of you could just give me a summary of both what you have gained out of doing this book together and what you expect in uh, any future projects you have planned either individually or together well, uh, well, well go ahead Kathleen <laughs> okay um, I, I have to say that Denise simply uh, had a wealth of knowledge as uh, having been a, a UFO and abduction investigator for 21 years and also uh, having been an experiencer herself gave her special insight that most people simply don't have. And the fact that she recalls so much of this in such detail is really very, very remarkable, and she's an excellent hypnotic subject at the same time. I'm fortunate enough to live near her so that we can continue to investigate her experiences uh, as they occur, and uh, I just have to say that I continue to, to move on. Uh, I don't have a lot of long-term plans. I take things as they come, and I move in whatever direction it is that I need to go in at that particular time. Mm. But uh, Denise and I are going to be working on another commonality to, uh, to ask some questions that we didn't ask on the first study that we did. And I'm yeah, we didn't talk to about your study a whole study. lot. Um, maybe just briefly touch upon that. I didn't bring that up. What you call them, the the Morden Stoner survey that's part of this book. Yes, uh, Denise and I had developed a, a survey. It had 45 questions, and we advertised widely um, for participants. We had to have 50, in my mind, uh, with my background in sociology, uh, in order to make this a valid study. It took us a year to accomplish. We had self-identified experiences who took part in this, as well as some people who... Uh, whose events are widely known and uh, believed to have actually occurred, who participated as well. And we also had a 25-person control group, so to speak, of individuals who stated that they had not had a UFO abduction experience. And in the end, we found 23 commonalities among experiencers, uh, which is very compelling. We've talked about that in the book uh, quite extensively. Denise has all 23 of those um, commonalities, and Jenny, the second person we wrote about, has all 23 as well. It's, yeah, it's a fascinating uh, survey or questionnaire or study, and I have felt compelled, the word I used the other night with Kathleen, to move forward on another questionnaire, and Kathleen doesn't know it, but I've now got 30 more questions with questions built in for her to look at for the next study to send to her. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> After we, we did the, the, the survey, people came up to us and said, well, why didn't you ask this, or why didn't you ask that? So we started writing down the questions that they would like to know the answers to so that they will be included on this next survey as we go along. Well, it sounds like you've uh, developed uh, a, a methodology in, in, in bringing out uh, more details, looking at the questions that are in the survey and reading the statistics. Do you have a statistical abstract for uh, a database that you're keeping f with uh, subject responses on, on these, these, uh, these Q&As? 
I can tell you that uh, it's it's more than an abstract. Um, I do have um, the, all of the results in my computer, and I did the statistical analysis. But anyone can go to my website and read the report, uh, which is posted there at Kathleen dash martin dot com excellent uh denise what's what's uh in your future do you plan to continue doing more work on your own past and uh investigations uh within or without uh mufon well i have been working independently all along and i'm also working with a group out of pennsylvania that i have gone ahead and helped them to grow and extend. Oh, like really? I'm Florida in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I know. Well, it's uh, Butch Witkowski. And he's okay, a, uh, I know who that is, yes. Okay, he has now got at least two full vans fully equipped with equipment like you wouldn't believe. And he can pull those vans up, get in them, and travel to any point that he needs to go to for research. I need to talk um, to him. Yeah, he's uh, you, yes. He's doing some interesting oh. stuff. We were in contact a while back, but you know, uh-huh. things drop in and out. That sounds very interesting. Uh, yes, you need to take a look at that site, and he's going to be coming down and speaking to my group um, in the next couple of months. He's going to bring down a van so that we can all take a look. He's he's got equipment that's just. Absolutely unbelievable, and some things he's doing will be important. And then I'm going to be holding a meeting this summer at some point for uh, abductees, and then I want to get this next study out. I feel like it's going to be really, really important. I want to go a little more in depth with Kathleen's okay because I want it to be something that both of us do since we put out the first one together. I'd like the second one to be something we do together also. Well, it sounds like uh, you have a a good working relationship together. The only other thing I was going to ask you is um, statistically, I know the statistical field on abductees is strongly slanted towards females. Is anyone doing uh, work uh, extensively with male contactees and, and the, the details behind that? Well, I think I can tell you that uh, many men have contacted me recently, and I believe that it's more men than, than women who have. Really? Now that's surprising. Yes, yes. Uh, but on our survey, there were about twice as many women as men who participated, and we found that. Uh, the, in the control group, there were uh, more men than women who participated, so it wasn't a matter of women being more likely to fill out a questionnaire. But yes, more recently, uh, many, many men have been in touch with me. Yeah, that's an area I, I would, would like to see. Too. Go ahead, Denise. I'm sorry, Denise. Oh, that. I would have to say that also, but uh, men, they're a little bit more sneaky because they'll come in the back door and catch mm. you unawares mm-hmm. and say, I really need to talk about this, and uh, can I can I keep your confidence, and, you know, they're a little bit more careful because of their jobs and their families and their situation, and women are, are tending to come out more now than men, but I, I find it about equal from my experience. Everybody's a little different. Well, that may be uh, one data point tonight that I walk away with because my own <clears throat> background and experiences that so far I've seen predominantly women abductees, w- obviously the males are out there, but m- my s- suspicion is that they're just the, the guys haven't come forward yet. So it's good to hear that. Um, as we're wrapping up here, uh, one more time to let people know where they can find you, where they can find the book. Okay, um, my website is Kathleen-Marden, M-A-R-D-E-N, dot com, and you can purchase the alien abduction files there if you'd like an autographed copy. Uh, also, my um, um, lectures this year, and I will be actually in Pittsburgh in November as well. Excellent. That's so, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Western Pennsylvania, Eastern 
Yeah, Western Pennsylvania MUFON meeting. Right. Yes, that's correct. Good, excellent. I want to thank you both for coming on tonight and for taking time and for being patient with us through the tech glitches and uh, for answering so many questions with so much depth. This was a very, very interesting show for me tonight, and I think the uh, listeners, the folks in the chat room, were pretty engaged by it as well. Uh, So my thanks again to you, Kathleen Martin and Denise Stoner, for coming on Off Planet Radio tonight. Hope to talk to you both very soon. Thank you, too. Thanks for having us on. And that's going to close it out for tonight. We'll be back next week with Chris Holly will be with me as my co-host. And uh, our guest will be ufologist and radio talk show host, Kate Valentine. That's next week on Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you. And uh, give them a report.